Uh, Dr. Emil Silvestru is a PhD in geology from Babish Boye University in Cluj, Transylvania, yes. Transylvania, which is uh, Romania, right? Yes. Um, and you're a, uh, a world authority on the geology of caves. You've published uh, at this point 39 scientific papers. You've co-authored a couple of books. Just the titles are intimidating. Terra Natural Catastrophes and the Geologic Column Perspectives Within Diluvial Geology. Mm. <laughs> just a new book came out, the cave book now. The so. cave book, that's right. And, and uh, we, we've, um, we've got so much to, talk, to uh, talk about. In fact, I'll say right off the top, we've got to have you back. But uh, when we were uh, discussing the movie last time, um, there was a movie about to open the Toronto Film Festival called right. Creation. Right. Um, it, was your film done as a, uh, a counterbalance to creation, or did you just happen to produce them at about the same time? I think it's uh, God's planning for it. We didn't know about the creation film until we already started working on our film. Uh, but uh, creation is actually a motion picture. Ours is more of a documentary. Right. Uh, I think they were desperately trying to counter us, right. <laughs> I, I would think. But. Uh, uh, in all honesty, it was probably just God's gracious timing, mm -hmm. so people would have both perspectives. What kind of reaction are people uh, giving you from seeing your film? Because, it, I mean, it, it's, it's quite earth-shaking. I mean, everyone is raised uh, to believe the earth is billions of years of age, and, and, you know, we know all about that. Your film presents a much younger perspective on, on the planet. How, what, what's the response? It does actually present both views. Yeah. We have deliberately decided to make this a balanced approach. Right. to reveal Darwin the man as he was. Right. So all interviewees, many of them, the majority of them being uh, evolutionists, were aware that this is going to show both sides. Right. Therefore, I, I would think that the reaction is very good thus far, so you, because people see that we can be balanced. Right, you're balanced, which uh, is refreshing. Um, I want to talk about the flood. Mm. Because in, in our last interview, you, you, you referred to uh, dating and uh, trying to understand how old the Earth is and so on. And as a geologist, uh, you have a perspective on the flood uh, as it relates to dating and uh, the age of the world. But first, the, I guess the first question that most uh, laymen would ask is, was Noah's flood real or, uh, you know, uh, was it global or was it local, was it regional? Uh, what's your perspective on that? Well, I, I'm forced first and foremost to use logic in approaching this. And if Noah's flood was a local or regional flood, that creates both logical and theological problems. Now, here are the logical problems. If it was local or regional, why build an ark? Right. Noah had nearly 100 years to move away from that area. The animals which have been programmed to come to the ark could have been easily programmed to move away from the flooded area. Then the birds could have flown away the moment the flood started. We have birds today flying nonstop 12,000 kilometers in the migration every year. So that shouldn't be a problem. It's illogical. Why go to the earth? Just move away from there. Right. And then there's the theological problem. God has promised Noah in the ninth chapter of Genesis that he will never ever destroy the world with another flood. If that was local or regional, we had so many of those and millions died in them, which technically means God has not kept his promise to Noah, the only righteous man on earth at that point. So how would he keep his promise to me, the sinner? Logically, I need to accept that Noah's flood was global. Now, because I'm a geologist, the moment I can accept this much water, uh, doing so much geological work, I can easily visualize the vast majority of fossils and sediments being laid down in this global water catastrophe. Because suddenly, this whole scenario changes. You see, if I look at, at, at a deep or a very deep column of sediments which contain uh, fossils of various levels of organization, all theological bias aside, I can only interpret it in two ways. One would be slow accumulation over time with animals slowly evolving, or it could be also the result of a sudden deposition in a watery catastrophe with the animals selectively buried, like the most primitive, of course, at the bottom, and this is where we find most of the fossils because they attach to the bottom or live very deep down there. And then gradually more and more developed animals because their normal habitat is closer to the surface. And these are logical ways to interpret it without using any religious uh, reference at all. So my change in my perspective of the way I was looking at the whole fossil record and by consequence the entire history of the earth was to postulate the fact that it was a global catastrophe. Um. What impact, then, does this global catastrophe have 
on dating, on our uh, attempts to understand the age of the Earth from the, uh, the fossil record? While it has a massive uh, impact, first, in terms of pure sedimentary uh, interpretation, if you can interpret the vast majority of sediments, many kilometers of them, the world's thickest sediments are actually between the Tigris and the Euphrates, 26 kilometers thick. Okay, so if they're all the result of the water catastrophe, then I don't need and I don't, don't have room for millions of years to explain them because they were deposited during the catastrophe. Uh, secondly, you see, there are certain events that happen during the flood that cannot be repeated. Like, for example, the process of fossilization. A fossil is a dead creature in which all organic matter has been replaced by mineral matter. It's not just a dead creature encased in a rock. That can easy, easily be done today, but there's always bacteria inside such a creature which will eventually destroy it from inside. Now you have to arrest that bacteria's development too and replace all the organic matter with mineral matter to produce a fossil. Well, nobody can produce a fossil today. We don't know how that can be done. I do actually get this request every now and then from students. How do I produce the fa effects of a quick fossil? And I say, I have, I have no clue, and nobody has. But the fact is that we have fossils mineralized dead creatures. And th the flood is the only environment in which I can explain this. Well, that would mean that some incredible amount of solutions were emerging from deep inside the earth, solutions heavily laden with all sorts of minerals. It's what geologists call today volatiles. And they, as they moved through this huge pile of soft sediments laid down during the flood, which contained dead creatures here and there, those solutions would replace the, mineral, the, the organic matter with mineral matter and then bind together the grains to produce hard rock. So a sand becomes sandstone, a mud, a mudstone, a lime, a limestone. And all this happens very quickly because we do have, for example, unhatched dinosaur skin fossilized. Now, you cannot leave an egg out there unhatched for a long time because it's just rotting away. So the fossilization had to take place very quickly in order to preserve the skin, right? Hmm. And that's only during the flood that you can Im imagine such a mechanism because it's even imagining it is difficult. Uh, first, uh, thirdly, you see, there's this very vast domain of geology known as metamorphic rocks. You can take any kind of another rock and because of pressure, temperature, and chemicals, it changes into a different rock. That's known generally as a metamorphic process. Well. Thus far, and the way I learned this is, cool, is that there are different kinds of metamorphic processes, some induced by temperature, some by pressure, some by fluids. But my personal experience in the field has actually shown me that I can interpret virtually all metamorphic formation as a result of fluids, just simply chemically changing a rock. So then, that's exactly what I had during the flood. Immense volume of fluids moving through the entire planet and, of course, changing the rocks. And there is good evidence for it today. Uh, a couple of years ago, I believe, in, uh, in Asia, a huge anomaly was discovered, uh, which is uh, something unusual inside the Earth at 600 miles of depth. And that is known as the Beijing anomaly. It essentially means there's water in the Earth's mantle. It's water in the middle of fire, 600 miles down. And the volume of water estimated is equ equivalent of the Arctic Ocean. Now, how would you end with this much water down there in the molten rocks, unless it came from the surface during the flood? So there's, there's good evidence out there if you're willing to interpret it as the result of a flood. How do they discover water 600 miles down? How do they